The John Campia Show, in association with Designing Hollywood, presents... Welcome to the Designing Hollywood Podcast. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. The Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies, the movie industry, and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by the United American Costume Company. Today's guest is a costume designer born and raised in Krakow, Poland. She started her professional activities as an assistant of the Polish film director, I'm going to not do this right, Agnesa Holland. And <laughs> <Yes, si> Holland. <laughs> is that good? All right. And since then, she has designed costumes for dozens of performances in the theater and for dance, television, and films. She's worked with director Ty West. She's worked on films, favorites of mine, such as Helen High Water, and You Were Never Really Here. And her most recent work is The Green Knight and the upcoming X, which I can't wait to see another collaboration with director Ty West. Please welcome Malgosia Trzanska to the Designing Hi. Hollywood podcast. <laughs> Thank you for coming here, and I apologize for all those mispronunciations <laughs> in advance. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Well, I have to ask you, um, you know, Poland has a, a really rich history of cinema. And when you were growing up, were you like, I think about some of my favorite films, The Double Life, uh, Koslowski's The Double Life of Veronique, The Three Colors trilogy, and his mm -hmm. masterful The Decalogue series. Did you grow up uh, in Poland watching Polish cinema? I did, and actually my mom is a, an incredible cine cinephile, cinephile. Uh, and she was actually, um, she was running a film club in her university and you know was always watching, watching, watching. Um, so we definitely watched movies a lot. We didn't have a VCR, so it was just, you know, just going to the movies. Um, but you named uh, Double Life of Veronique. That is like one of my top three, I think, movies. Oh, it's incredible. Of, of all time. And it does, you know, part of it does happen in Krakow. So it was, you know, seeing because it is not a, you know, it is a global movie in a way. So it was seeing my town, my tram, my myself <laughs> in a movie that was, that also had another side to it, you know? So that was, that one is whew, forever a favorite. Oh, it's so good. I mean, it, it, and it's interesting. I grew up in Seattle going to the Seattle International mm -hmm. Film Festival. So I was exposed to a lot of, of international cinema, but collecting, we had like the Criterion collection. So we were able to get like, those beautiful transfers of those films. Now you can get them all on Blu-ray here. And, you know, I've always been, there's something about, there's something about the reality in Polish cinema. I don't know what you'd call it. I always say verisimilitude, but mm -hmm. the, the, it's amazing. Some of the films got made, especially under uh, communist rule. And there's so many wonderful films and I would bring more up, but I, I, I'm afraid to massacre the names of the <laughs> direct. <laughs> uh, Andres Waja? Waja? Vida. Vida. Mm -hmm. Okay, see? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. right. You're doing great. You know uh, the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And of course, <laughs> uh, we were just talking about, but Andre Zwawski, who mm -hmm. who made Possession, but he also made a movie called The Devil that I'm a, I'm a huge fan of. And then he made his unreleased science fiction epic that was shut down by the communists and they never got to finish it, <laughs> which I'd love to see. <laughs> but so let's back to you. Um, so growing up, you your mom was a cinephile. Did mm -hmm. you did you have dreams of getting into the movies? No, never. I, I honestly didn't know that that was a job. I knew acting was a job. My my best friend, who also, uh, her name is Malgosha, and we're best friends still now. Her two aunts and uncles were um, both theater and movie actors, so I knew you could act. But besides that, it was like an actor and a movie. Like, I didn't know it got made. I didn't know you could, like, have your hand in it. Um, so it never never really occurred to me until honestly the first time that i realized costumes were a thing was when i watched almodovar's kika it wow. was in high school i was first grade of high school and i it was my first time uh when i ran away from school and i didn't have anywhere to go i was like what do i do if i'm not at school so i went to the movies and it was playing randomly there and I just like lost it because suddenly <laughs> I I realized that there were it was clothes that were not clothing they they were more and it was specifically um, 
the Jean-Paul Gaultier designed um, um, outfits for for Victoria Abril with the incredible oh, yeah. cameras and breasts and everything. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and the first time that I re realized that like someone made this, someone thought about it and made this. Um, so from then on, I started a little bit thinking about it, but it still didn't occur to me, like, how do I connect that thought with me working in a movie that was like, uh, uh, that wasn't really happening until much, much later. <laughs> um, and then I had, I have to credit my, my boyfriend who was in a film club in school and we started making little tiny things together. I, I just, I mean, not even making things together. I would go and help out. Um, and realize that like what he is doing is what the other movies are, but just much bigger <laughs> and not in a basement. You know? Well, that's great. So you, did you, did you know that, like, how did you, a lot of the costume designers that we talked to here had a pretty rigorous educational, uh, upbringing in terms of learning about design, learning about art mm -hmm. history. Uh, did you follow that same path? I did, I, but it was with, with slight detours because I, when I left high school, I didn't quite know what to do. So I did, for a year, I did cultural anthropology and for a year I did history of arts. Um, so both things very, very related to uh, both costumes and movie making in general. Um, just, you know, an idea of culture and, and dissecting culture and, and researching it and so on. But only then I did go, I went to Damu, which is the theater version of the FAMU, the famous FAMU film school in Prague. In Prague, it was, you know, it's a theater school. Um, so initially I was doing sets and costumes for theater. Mm. And I knew at that point, I knew I wanted to do movies, but the, um, the film program was only the, the master's degree. So I had to go through the bachelor's program first and learned a lot. So that was, that was really good. Um, and then during that time i did i did meet i was super lucky that i managed to work with agnieszka holland which honestly this is like <laughs> i was super lucky because a friend of mine who was in the acting department got cast as janoshik a main part in her movie you know just like <laughs> completely amazing and somehow told someone about me and i guess because i spoke polish and czech and english they they were like fine she can come <laughs> um i was the worst assistant like <laughs> I, i'm so sorry <laughs> we were in the you know deep snows of slovakia somewhere on a mountain and I would not even, you know, I wouldn't even think about getting Agnieszka a jacket nor anything. Cause I was like, look at those dresses, look at those pants, look at those shoes. <laughs> so they could have very well fired me, but they didn't, um, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> um, and so that was, you know, doing like little tiny student productions and then going to a real movie was a shocking experience. <laughs> and one that like, you know, put a stamp on, yes, I, I need to be doing this forever and ever. Well, you mentioned Almodovar and design, especially costume design, plays such a huge part in yes. in his films. And uh, he has a new film out, Parallel Mothers. But I'm wondering, are there other films that became really influential to you? Did you look at musicals of the 50s or science fiction films? Or what were what were some of your other influences that you uh, liked? No, not musicals. <laughs> to say i still i'm very un-american in that in that way i uh, it's very hard work for me to sit through a musical. that's okay that's for okay as well <laughs> paul taswell i you know I, i'm just for him <laughs> but um no i think um i think the there were two one was eiko ishioka with with dracula oh god yes i honestly if there was one film that i had to watch for four costumes over and over again till I die and nothing else, it would be that. Um, I have a poster she painted for Apocalypse Now, a giant poster on my wall. What an amazing uh, artist she was. Started. Oh, amazing. And that that film, it's, uh, the armor, the Dracula armor is one of the great creations in cinema. Honestly, it was a huge influence. That whole movie was a huge influence over over what my team did for Green Knight. Mm. We can ta tab that later, but definitely, just a, um, and I don't know the word anachronicity, you know, like just being ballsy and fun and like not not being historical in any way, just like going with the feeling. Mm -hmm. um, 
incredible. And then another another designer over multiple movies is Sandy Powell, who I just I mean, she is to me an absolute goddess um, or God rather. Um, I did. I think the first time I, I saw her work was either in Edward the Second or in Wittgenstein. Mm. Um, so in, in Derek Jar and then Caravaggio. But again, it was the same thing. It was clearly very coherent and very visual, but very free of period yeah. or, or using period at its will. And so I think that like ballsiness made me just braver, I think, as a designer and like opened my eyes that it this is not a museum piece. We're not doing reenactment. We're creating something, something else. Um, so her and, and actually I was thinking about it yesterday that there's like such a straight line from the Derek Dar uh, the, her work with um, Derek, Derek Jarman, Jarman. Yeah. and then her work on the favorite. There is a, a very, you know, you can see the evolution and like, yes, this is clearly the same person. Um, she's amazing. Um, so those I would say were two, you know, two influences that I was like, this is what I want to do. Like this, this is where I want to be uh, like, you know, <laughs> this is the goal. Um, yeah. I love that you invoke Derek Jarman, but I don't think Derek Jarman is a filmmaker that gets enough, uh, scrutiny here in the United States. And, uh, I definitely grew up watching a lot of his work as well. So it's great to hear that. Now, what's interesting to me about what you're saying is, I love the idea of being unfettered, sort of not chained to history and period. And that comes into play in in The Green Knight, which we'll talk about. But you also did things like, um, I really liked uh, uh, Hell or High Water. When you, you know, the American Southwest, you really captured uh, the feel, but that kind of was very, it was very contemporary and very much, it had a Western feel to it. Yeah. So you 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 still can bring if you need authenticity you can do that very well as well. I I think there's the different. It's it's funny that you say that because I do think that authenticity is a different thing than being period accurate. Mm. This is the I think the costumes were authentic. I mean yes, it here it crossed over, but and it was realistic. But I think my goal is to be for my world to be authentic to the logic of the world of the story. So whatever it is, which I think works in, in Green Knight as well, yes. that it's like we create this logic in this world and then the costumes have to work within it logically and authentically. Um, and then it's, then it works. Right. right. But, um, but that's the, yeah. But I think research is super important and like getting to know the, 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 the world of our story. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it need, like you of course have to know and understand the period rules a hundred percent. And I would never start a movie without going to the, the real, the historical reality first, even uh, whether it's, you know, Texas in two years ago or, or medieval England, you have to start somewhere. But, but I think it is the most important thing is the authenticity for the, the world of the story. Right. And I think, you know, what I love about film is you don't want to always see reality it's because it's not real yeah. and you know you've worked you've worked on things like you worked on stranger things which is a show that again it's period but it's 80s period and yet you're still able to sort of there's a science fiction horror bent to it all so how did you find yourself working on stranger things um so I wanted to backtrack a little bit to magical realism and just magic in, mm. in movies and TV shows that I that I adore, and I think this is my my favorite genre in both literature and TV, film, everything is when a project has strict rules and is very set in some sort of a reality, and then suddenly one thing breaks it and it becomes a whole new different thing, and it just becomes magic. So it's like. Um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind or being John Malkovich or even her in a way is is the same thing. It's just like those are the movies that are my favorite. <laughs> oh, I, I think her is one of the masterpieces of 21st century science fiction. It's phenomenal. amazing. Yeah, and gorgeous costumes too. So smart. Um, but Stranger Things, I had um, a friend of mine was the product was 
interviewing um, uh, as a production designer and he mentioned me to the Duffer Brothers and somehow I managed to get an interview and I thought I did great. <laughs> I was like so excited. We clearly had a connection and then I didn't get it. <laughs> it's just like oh <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was a bummer uh, <laughs> and then um after they already started production i got a i got a phone call from a friend of mine who um is a phenomenal hairstylist who um who is working on the show and she was like are you free what are you doing um and so <laughs> they asked me if i could join the show as you know as it was running already and you know i tried to be like Oh, no, I don't know. Let me check my calendar. But of course, I was like, oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> Are you kidding? Um, so I, I jumped into it uh, midway through uh, the first season. And it was already a very well set up, very well oiled machine. So I truly cannot cre take credit for, you know, setting up the look because Kimberly did it beautifully. Um, and very honestly, if they had picked me from the beginning, I don't know if I would have done so well you know because it was at that point it would have been the biggest show to date that i you know that i would have been a part of um and i guess because i never really assisted anyone i never you know i did i was a student a design student in damu and then did um my master's degree at the costume department at tish so i was oh. like I am a designer with two diplomas, but I've never, you know, except for um, uh, being Agnieszka's PA on on the big movie back then in Slovakia, I never worked in a in a costume department. I've never seen how you resolve issues in the costume department. I never had a template. So every time I start on a project that is bigger than the previous one, I'm reinventing the wheel, <laughs> and I'm fully aware of it. That I'm like, I don't know how to do it. We'll figure it out, but. <laughs> But I don't have, you know, I, I, um, I never, never learned from anyone how to do things. Hmm. And so this would have been, I mean, I'm sure it would have been okay. But to be very honest, they did the right thing. They, they went with a seasoned designer. Um, and, you know, and then I, I was lucky enough to join in and, and kind of put a little bit of my, of my stamp on it. And uh, it was a phenomenal project and did just like marvels to, to my career for sure. So I'm very grateful. Is there a difference? You've worked on a number of TV shows, TV series. Is there a difference uh, between working on a television series and working on a feature film? Yes, and I, I think now there is more of a trend to um, to have at least like limited series directed by by one director mm -hmm. with one team. That it's kind of more like a you know six hour movie or eight hour movie. And I think that is more friendly to me. I am a very script based based designer. So I, I need to know where are we at the beginning? Where are we in the middle and where do we end? So I can create an arc and I can help lead the story um, with, with my design and just help and support it. When I don't know where we're going, it is it's extremely difficult so the on the series where you know you're getting scripts as you go it's it's a little scary <laughs> it's just like <laughs> a, of a comfortable place for me and i think i am less successful in supporting the characters you know because if i don't know where the the end goal is i mean on a movie you change things a lot as as you go along there's script revisions there's you know character switch and so on but you know the shape and i feel like that's a better place to work to work with and you can kind of sculpt it easier if you if you know the arc right absolutely um and i find that that interesting that that uh about leading the story through not knowing where it's going to go you you have to know where it's going to go and uh and it's funny because i think we're now used to limited series so yeah. often you'll see something like the queen's gambit i don't know if oh. you've seen that oh uh, my god fantastic i mean i Honestly, at the last, oof, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I cry a lot when I get touched, especially by <laughs> good costumes. I was standing in front of the TV, crying and screaming at the end. <laughs> I love it. 
Uh, it, it's an amazing, you know, it's an amazing series. And it's, it's um, you know, seeing Scott Frank go from Godless, the miniseries. I love that you're, I love that you really are tearing up. For those of you listening to the podcast right now. <laughs> no, I'm crying. <laughs> uh, no, it was amazing. Scott Frank, you know, he really understands, I think, how to employ costumes in his work as well. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, you, you, you've, what I, what I find interesting about all the costume designers I've spoken to is you can effortlessly move between genres. I mean, obviously you've now worked on two Ty West movies. Yes. Um, and they're very, they're very different kinds of films, <laughs> you know, and I have to say <laughs> that the, I, I'm a fan of his, his work. I mean, he, obviously he's done some great great horror his new film x which uh i just recently watched the trailer for uh, looks absolutely bonkers and uh, <laughs> in a very good way um what's it like for you to develop a relationship with a director who and move through various projects is it easier for you do you enjoy uh having that kind of a relationship so what is that like? <laughs> uh, it's honestly, it's the best. It's it's uh, it's the same like working with the same crew over and over again. That you you do develop a shorthand, you do develop more just deeper trust. And I was so proud that Ty, Ty asked me back because initially um, I did hear that he never works with the same designer again, and I was like, please, please pick me, pick me. Again. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's he's wonderful, and it was. Um, I'm, I, I don't want to tell too much about X since it's, you know, it's just the trailer that is out, but we, we shot in New Zealand and it was spectacular. It was just, I've never been to New Zealand before and it was in the middle of the pandemic. And yet, you know, I left New York with like slushy gray snow and, uh, and middle of the pandemic. And I went to New Zealand in the middle of the summer with like people sharing drinks and eating oysters together and no one even wearing a mask. So it was this bizarre, trip that I was like, am I in the future or am I in the past? How am I, where, where did the, the time go? Um, and yeah, we did, we had a lot of fun. It was yeah. I, I, I worked on a couple of films in New Zealand. It's amazing. I was there for like three years and, uh, I loved it, I, it was fantastic. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to that. So we'll see that. Um, uh, I, can, I mean, I can't wait to see X. Cannot wait. But I, but I think that you know, one of the things that I loved, I think one of the most spectacular movies visually I saw last year was in fact the Green Knight. And I mean, it, it the work in it. I, I knew it was going to be great from the trailer because watching it, I'm like, what is this? You know. And then you go read the Arthurian tale uh, and all of that, and it's like, oh. And I couldn't, I couldn't wait to see it. But to me. There's been so many Arthurian tales from Camelot, you know, your favorite, a musical, to, of course, my favorite Arthurian movie, uh, Excalibur. Mm -hmm. And I think Excalibur is exactly the kind of movie that was talk you were talking about earlier, where why, why is there a... Why does there have to be a leaf blower in the neighbor's house next door? <laughs> I mean... Really? <laughs> so anyway, um, to talk about that, because Excalibur to me is the kind of movie, exactly the kind of movie that you were. Uh, I almost want to go and yell at this guy and be like, <laughs> does this really have to happen now? Do you have to do this now? Apparently he does. Um, anyway. My favorite so, part of the week. <laughs> Oh, I mean, leaf blowers on a Saturday morning. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like he's literally right, right next to me. Um, the, the, my studio here is right next to the neighbor's fence. I see, I see. So, <laughs> so what I was going to ask you, you talked about reality being disassociated yeah. from, you, you can have period accurate costumes and you could do an Arthurian movie like that, but Excalibur obviously dismissed with reality altogether and it was completely stylized well i kind of felt that the green knight in a way did that as well i mean magical realism all the things that you spoke about were really brought to bear uh in that movie and it was it was just a knockout and how did you first of all how did you get involved with the film and 
<laughs> How did you? Can you really hear that? Can you? Yeah, hear? No, no, I'm. It's very faint. Oh, okay, good. How did you get involved with the Green Knight, and um, how did you begin working on the film? Like, where did you start? Mm-hmm. So I I did a movie with uh, with David before um, I did Ain't Them Buddy Saints a while back in in Texas, mm-hmm. which undoubtedly is why I then got Hell or High Water because it was you know kind of a um, dirty, dusty western um, ish story. Um, I have a funny story about meeting Lowry though um, that I I, I do want to bring up. Oh, you have to tell it. <laughs> I was in Sundance, I don't remember what year that was, um, a long chunk ago, and he had uh, he had a short in the competition um, called, um, I'm forgetting the name, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, totally, uh, totally uh, missing the name, but one of his, one of his, I think his best short film and one of his best movies to me. And he's made a lot of short films, so I would, I, I, <laughs> I, I do you know what year it was? Uh, I don't remember. It's Will Oldham and a little boy, um, just two of them. Uh, and it's a story about a dad telling his son a, a good night, just a, um, a good night so- story. And it is, you know, like theoretically, that's just it. It's just hmm. like a father and a son in a bedroom. And yet the the words because truly that's all it, all it was because the the you know the set and 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 camera were kind of you know controlled with by that space um a little bit the words took you to a completely different um oh it's called pioneer yes oh. um yeah the words of the script managed to make your mind travel to the movies that he is now being able to move to like huge, you know, vast landscapes to like sweeping camera moves. Like the words did that. And it was so spectacular. So this was dated 2011, Pioneers yes. 2011. Yeah. And I was just like gobsmacked by that movie. Um, and it was early enough and sometimes that they still, when they had a program, they had like the director's email address. In it. <laughs> and I was like, yes. <laughs> So I just started emailing him and it was um, him and James Johnston and uh, Toby Hallbrooks would walk. You could see them almost like kind of ZZ Top trio, like walking <laughs> around the park city. They just looked so phenomenal. Um, and I would just look on, you know, just dr- dreaming about working with them one day. And I just started emailing David out of the blue because I heard Sandy Powell say that she cold called um, or wrote to Derek Jarman. And I was like, I'm gonna do that too. <laughs> and he, for whatever reason, started responding. And then when um, uh, Ain't Them Buddy Saints came, ar- came around, and I think they had another designer to begin with. I'm not actually sure what, what happened there. Mm-hmm. But uh, he, he reached out to me and said, can you actually do this? Like, we think you can do it, but can you do this? Um, and so that was that was the beginning of that, and I just absolutely worked working with him and the whole the whole team and Jade Healy, the production designer, the the, the whole family. They're truly great friends. Um, and so when David wrote the Green Knight, um, he sent me the script early on. And initially, we thought the movie was going to go a little bit earlier, so I was like mm. rushing to you know to start researching and uh, just dove into it very quickly and then luckily had more time to live with it because it, it started pushing but i just like held on to it for dear life and was not letting go because it was like this is absolutely a stunning stunning script and stunning movie um and so i started first of all i did because david is vegan i thought let's throw that curveball at at <laughs> at the costume team let's do it vegan Wow. Um, now, okay. Uh, what does that tell tell the folks at home? What would that mean? No leather. Not only that, it's no silk because, which I honestly didn't know that in silk. I mean, now it's so obvious, but I didn't know that in silk production you you kill the silkworms, you boil them with the with the threads. There is something called the peace silk or or ahimsa silk, which does it without 
without cruelty. So there is a way of using it. But in general, silk is is not a vegan um, textile. So no silk, no wool, which meant no felt, of course, no furs and then no leathers. So it was a very, wow. it was a very interesting start of, a, you know, considering the period because it made me look out for different solutions. So that was one like technical thing. And then I did, I think I was in London. Um, my husband was shooting something in London. So I started just going to the British Museum and researching things that, because, you know, the poem is written, the poem that the film is based on is written around the 14th century, mm. but the Arthurian tales are originating around fifth or sixth century. So I started, I just went deep into, you know, early, early middle ages and started researching that era. And that was so exciting and so fascinating because there's really, except for some paintings, there's really no, I mean, no textiles have been preserved. The only things that stayed are metal threads that were interwoven in textiles. And also what was, super visually fascinating was um, in certain grave, um, you know, when um, you would go and um, excavate a grave, um, sure. you would find a skeleton partial, you know, like still some of the bones would still remain. And then you would have, say, a, a fibula or a pin that was placed in a certain place or a belt buckle placed in a, a certain place. So there were like little ghost it was like ghost fashion where only the the metal clasps or threads would remain but nothing else so this was a just like such a visceral way to start a movie that it was like it's not there it's just like these little buttons remain so you get to create what you want but it just has to like fit in this this scheme so that was that was fascinating to me um and the metal definitely does have you know it does appear through the movie um, in, in the in the final design, but honestly, the the first visual um, inspiration or like something that captured me was, and I might be mispronouncing his name, so I'm sorry. Um, Edward Muybridge, the photographer. Mm -hmm. That was that's my like one reference for for my work on the movie, because in the script which was so beautifully written the thing that stood out to me the most was um a weird fragmentation and we are kind of watching this guy go go through certain motions and then go back and then is he going forward is he going like you watch his journey but you watch like little bits of it and it could go either way um so i i really love that and that was that was visually hugely important to me and it does appear in, for example, in the mother and sister's clothing, they do have kind of modular outfits that, you know, you could have the, the veil on the head or on the shoulders, depending on your mood or your age or it's down or it's it just like there are those little like muy Bridgian moments. <laughs> And I, I really love that. I really, really responded to that visually. Now that film, the the entire design of that movie is incredible. And I'm always curious to talk to people, obviously costumes, the costumes, on, especially on a movie like The Green Knight, you, you have to deal with production design and color mm -hmm. and the director of photography and the, the stylization of it all. On, on a film like that, were the, were the department heads, were you meeting with uh, the production designer and the director of photography while you d were developing this vegan look to the costumes absolutely and it, again it helps if it's friends because it's like you know it's not a it doesn't have to be formal and, and i mean not that it is formal at work normally but it's you just have a closer relationship so jade he healy was um the production designer who also did ain't Buddy saints and who al almost always works with with david um, and Andrew Palermo, who shot the um, ghost story, which again is one of my yeah. favorite movies. It's a great movie. Yeah. So very early on, we you know we talked about the style of it, and with Jade especially about colors and about going away from you know the rich ornamentation. There mm -hmm. was no patterns necessarily. It's just stripped down, and it's the same with the sets. Um, the story is the thing that it's almost as if <laughs> the only thing that remains is the story and the action. It's, you know, <laughs> the visuals are kind of subdued, um, except for maybe the, you know, the golden, um, the golden cloak is 
is like very very present and um uh ladies blue dress but all in all it's very timid and very very subdued right well i have to say one of the coolest things in this film is the green knight itself himself you know the, uh <laughs> Uh, that the 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 Christmas. I mean, I now, forever will think of the Green Knight as kind of a Christmas movie, but uh, you know the the entrance of this character is so spectacular, and you, you talk about something vegan costumes, but you basically created this character from a tree. That is that is exactly it. Yeah, <laughs> one of the, <laughs> one of the leathers or rather leather replacements that I was using was the tree bark or uh, sorry bark cloth. That is essentially the the little I mean textile that is underneath the bark of a tree um, by the stump, and it is it's it's been used in Africa, you know, in many many countries um, for a very long time. Ours was from Uganda, and it is you know it's just fibers of a tree. And we stitched it to make this giant, giant cloak. And when he walks, it's so amazing because it is, I mean, it's weirdly Shakespearean. It's like the forest is moving. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> but I was so thrilled by it. And it, it just, it added so much to the feel and texture of the movie. And honestly, if I didn't go the vegan route, I would never looked for it, have looked for it. So that was, that was such a blessing that, it, yes, it was a curveball. And yes, we had to, you know we had to figure a lot of stuff out but i i love that fabric and also the blind woman's um white kind of cocoon is also that very same that very same tree bar uh, bark cloth um except that one has more of a felt texture hmm. it's just like very raw um felt looking um um um, texture but the green knight cloak it is i spent like hours and hours <laughs> rubbing baby lotion into it to make it a little <laughs> more leather like so i had a very intimate relationship with that cloak. <laughs> when you when you started you know when you made the choice to go I've, it's funny i've never heard a costume designer say well we went vegan when you when you made that choice what were some of the i don't know initial problems that arose i mean was it hard to create when you're working with actors or you're cloaking things did those kinds of fabrics drape across a body the way you wanted them to or what were some of the things that you had to do to make that work correctly so it was it was all fabrics that were new well i mean not all but the the leathers especially or the the woolens were were new to me so it was just figuring it out from the get-go the one thing that I'm not super thrilled with is the fake fur, because I did want to have, um, you know, I didn't want the movie to be unethically plastic. You know, I didn't want the, the, not, the vegan stuff to be just polyester, and a lot of it is. So it's it's a huge problem, um, and I couldn't find a fur replacement that was within our budget that looked real. So the um, the Lord. Um, Joel Edgerton's um, outfit was that was kind of <laughs> uh, it was a little play on on the traditional um, medieval medieval costumes and he's just like growing in fur and also appears as a bear at one point so the fur I felt there was quite necessary and it is that one was regular faux fur and sadly that is just plastic so that is you know the I regret that we couldn't have found and hopefully soon there will be replacements that are you know that are um, ethical but that was an issue um, and then for our background again we didn't have a large enough bu budget to create everything we built you know our main characters we built everything and the you know the knights and everyone who's featured um, we built everything from scratch but not the background so that was so those are rentals um mm. so we had, you know we had rental shoes and rental belts that were in fact leather and there's some wool as well we tried to stay away from it as much as we can uh, as, as much as we could but again at least it was a rental it was not you know no <laughs> new animals <laughs> right <laughs> right well the, the, those animals already gave up them their and presumably met for many many different films because they were exactly. you know maybe they maybe did they came from one of the sponsors of this show or something but <laughs> You know, you know, the the uh, so when you're when you're creating these, I'm curious, I mean, these fabrics and things when you're working with the director of photography, they know how to light 
costumes. They know how to light certain fabrics and how the light catches things and how that happens when somebody moves. And mm-hmm. were there were there problems or obstacles that arose because you were using vegan fabrics in terms of shooting them? No, I don't think so. It was we did test a lot of the um, both the the bark cloth and all the all the velvets that we use were just cotton velvets, and mm. honestly, I'm amazed at them. The the Gawain Golden Cloak it looks like silk velvet, but it's it's just a very pricey cotton one. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, that was actually um, that was an interesting one because it does it does photograph differently in candlelight and in daylight. Oh, okay. um, it goes red in in candlelight and kind of more greenish in in daylight and that was a weird thing we, we tested so many yellow um yellow velvets for that to land on this one but it's still it just like had a life of its own um and one thing that i want to say about the the cloak that i'm like really thrilled <laughs> thrilled with is um it's actually a fingerprint like the the um quilting is in a in a shape of a of a thumb thumbprint um because it was that one like one singular individual yeah <laughs> yeah which I, I i love like you don't see it really when you look at it it's just like it's richly quilted but it was it was a giant fingerprint developing something like like this uh, with with actors what is your relationship with i mean a lot of costume designers i guess it's kind of the same thing an actor i've said on the show many times that some of the most important hires on a movie are the costume designers and the hair and makeup people because yeah. you're, you're, you, the actors need to know that they look great. That's something that, that hair and makeup and costume design, you give the actors the tools they need to not worry about how they look, but to get into their characters. How do you find your relationship with actors? Um, I, I, yeah, we were so lucky to have incredible, incredible artists in the show. And so because I started designing quite early on, we didn't have much of the cast I think at all to begin with. So, um, for example, the king and queen. Maybe we did have the king and queen. I can't remember actually when. You know, I started very early on, so um, so it, it it evolved. But I think my first sketches were the king and queen, um, along with the the halo crown. So that that was something that was we knew we loved it, and we knew this would this would stay. Mm-hmm. And then the Milagros on the on the queen's dress and the sort of votive plates on the on the king's cape that was something that came very early on and kind of made everything else fall into place quite not easily but it like you know it was just slotted in somehow um but once dev was cast i just sent him sketches um and he you know he had a such a beautiful emotional response to not only to the sketches but also to to the costumes then and fittings it was it was wonderful now do you do your own sketches yes yes i do and i honestly don't i haven't figured out a way to not do them you know? <laughs> it's just such a so i mean even now i'm like holding a pen because i feel like if i don't hold a pen or a pencil my brain is not working um so <laughs> i don't know how to avoid that step because it's i don't know it until it's in front of me uh, and then you can change, you know. <laughs> uh, so, so yes, and and I enjoy I enjoy sketching very much. Um, and so, so I send I send all of our all of our characters. I, I just send them sketches first, and send them my kind of not not even a lookbook. It's more of an emotional response to the film yeah. or to the to the project, um, because I feel like this way they see where i came from emotionally and where i'm at right now but there's so much space you know i need their input as well and i love when when actors say like i was thinking about like what about flip-flops like because i want to walk in a certain way or you know like if they have their own little thing it's always it always makes things better you know it's um of they must are- love getting that from you yeah it's it's so it's just like so fun <laughs> um and very rarely, honestly, very rarely do I work with a person who's like, no, I want to look good. You know, like there's uh, the, the people that I've been privy to work with are so not vain and just want to do right by the project. And that is so exciting. Um, 
So yeah, <laughs> so sketches <laughs> and, 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 emo- and the, the emotional response. What are so? What were some of the other challenges that you faced? I mean, I keep I, I keep going on on. I keep thinking about the vegan costume idea, but were there there must have been other challenges as well in terms of the the. I mean, it's so stylized and it's so. I, there's not really uh, there hasn't been a film like this in quite some time and and I uh, you know thinking about about your influences and what you you've done what were other what other, other problems you had to surmount so definitely the you know the shit the figuring out how the crowns would sit on people's heads mm. that was a we like workshopped and then workshopped and then <laughs> I had a phenomenal phenomenal team truly and David Houghton was the one who was um who was doing our metal work and he he would just do a mock-up after a mock-up until it was like oh it sits i can move i can turn my head it's like let's go with it um and it was the same with the green knight's armor we decided to go with um because this was my world was set m- mostly kind of in early you know it was a fantasy version of like a fifth sixth century um um early medieval ages but i wanted the green knight to feel like something even more ancient um because he is you know he's not of that world he's of something even earlier as a a creature that has always existed so the the armor shape was i think i like combined maybe ancient greek armor with i don't even remember what were it was just you know just bits and bobs of research that just felt very basic and then i inscribed it with um sabaean um alphabet so it wasn't runes it wasn't you know it wasn't in this world it was something completely you know more ancient and and distant from the place we were in now did you did you make that decision yourself or was that something in the script no it was my decision and it was i mean i you know chose a few because i did want it to be real i didn't want it to just like create scribbles um so i picked a few alphabets and talked to david and wow visually that one felt good but also thematically you know it was something that was like way deeper in time that is so cool that you did that (laughs) and there's um if anyone wants to find out there's secret messages in there (laughs) (laughs) like hi mom (laughs) <laughs> I think one of them says help. <laughs> and then there's my, my whole team's names um, uh, inscribed in, in, in the alphabet, too. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I, I just love that idea. <laughs> that, so- that, kind of, that kind of creativity, do you find um, often that when you're working with directors and production designers, that you have that kind of freedom, that they're open to that kind of, that kind of, like, I would think that a production designer would be like, wait a minute, <laughs> who said you could use this alphabet? <laughs> no, we did. And Jade and I are, are, are friends. So it's, you know, it is, um, again, we have a shorthand and there's, there's a bunch of costumes that, <laughs> um, I think are only, I am the only person that was excited about them. Um, <laughs> and they still are in the movie, but not so much. Um, cause Jade was like, I don't know. I don't know what you meant, but there's, um, there's a bunch of um, lords and ladies in waiting around the um, in the court um, mm. surrounding the queen and, and king, and because so much of the um, the royalty was connected to the idea of holy, like very Catholic idea of holiness, mm. um, I did want to have them constantly praying, and so we made these um, wooden like hands that were attached to their dresses, but they were actually gloves. So they could, they could put their hands um, on their chest into those, you know, into those hollowed out um, um, glove hands and pray, but they could also, you know, like hold a glass of wine or, or pick their nose wow. and the hands are still praying because there is like a physical sculpture that is attached to their chest that is shaped like hands. Um, was that based on something out of from reality? No, that was another one of the Muy Bridge thing that it was like different phases. Okay. And so David got excited about it at first, and then it was like, it, because it's weird. It's a weird <laughs> thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're um, they're not super featured the, the the hands, but they're there, and I'm I'm very proud of them. 
to say. <laughs> but I love that. I mean, I love that 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 you took something from Roy and brought it into the into the film and made it work. Are there are there is there anything that in the movie that maybe no one would know about? I mean, something like this that um, you're particularly proud of that you you would want to focus on that nobody would know, maybe. I think honestly, the the Milagros and the votive plates on the on the king and queen, that was something that I that I was very very proud of, and it that took so much work. It truly, my team pricked their fingers multiple times. We had to drill holes in the Milagros to to attach them to the dress, um, and we we made all the all the votive plates for um, for the king's cape. And there are, again, there are little secrets there. There are little like. Um, a few of the plates are personal to to our group of friends. There's um, there's ghosts from the ghost story in there. There's uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a bit from a Thai West movie from In a Valley of Violence where our AD Dutch um, had an encounter with a rattlesnake, and that little plate is there, <laughs> secretly hidden. And also my wonderful assistant Robin, uh, who is Dutch's wife, they were pregnant with it with their first baby while on the movie. Um, so one of the votive place is the sonogram of the baby. <laughs> wow. Well, that's very cool. <laughs> so it's just little bits, you know, that are like not important to the story necessarily, but are like our meat, you know, are kind of important to our group, I guess. You know, they're like little, little, um, little historical moments <laughs> of, of friendship. Um, and then something that I actually really, really loved was the... Um, the mother and sisters um costumes i especially sarita who plays the mother she is such a phenomenal presence and i'm actually really excited because she's um on the new sex and the city right now and she's getting a lot of a lot of attention and i'm so thrilled for her because she is just like passion and fire just like in in a person incredible inc incredible presence and um her fitting actually was like i've never had a fitting like that she was just acting and you know moving the the garments so beautifully she like put her life into it Im immediately but those fabrics i did want to do um so first of all the the king and queen had there was a lot of pleats in the royal costumes that kind of reflected um the the rays of the halos uh, so there was again like some religious aspect to it um and then the mother and sisters who are kind of to the left of religion they're pagan and witches and all they um it wasn't pleats it was just kind of um fabric that was um it's not even primitive pleats it's just like um I, i'm missing a word not smushed but just crunched crunched <laughs> fabric, you know um but i did want to have their outfits reversible and I couldn't find a fabric that would act the way I wanted it to and have a double um, double color. So that was, I did spend like, I think two weekends just spraying gray spray paint, paint over, um, over the fabric or over one side of the fabric to have it like lightly coated with a, with a silvery gray. Um, and the other side is the copper, the, the like more, um, lustrous co copper that the fabric was originally so that that was a lot of work and i thought it looked it, it came out quite successful i was very proud of it um and then our <laughs> our sound department uh started asking can we can we do something to make them less loud and <laughs> we did, we, you know we tried everything we could think of ah that's what come on that's what your sound design you guys got to do that in post come on now I so I I thought it was like you know maybe like a little shush sound. They put the <laughs> the headphones on me and I was like I don't understand what's happening. What's happened? Something's wrong. <laughs> he was like no, that's the dress, <laughs> and it was just like the loudest. Like your um, uh, leaf blower guy has nothing on it. It was just like <laughs> <laughs> just like angry sea, just like so loud so i'm i'm very sorry but david was like all good all good we'll, we'll figure it out <laughs> we'll fix it fix it post you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, that's something that a lot of people don't you know you don't consider costumes can be loud yeah and i i tried to think about you know i i tried to try to be mindful of of every department because it's you know where it's a collaborative form and and 
one is not more important than the other. So I, I'm very sorry. I had no idea it was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> when you finally see, do, do you watch rushes? Do you watch dailies? Yes. Yeah. Do you do you do that every day? Yes. Yeah. D on this film, what was it like seeing? I mean, I would imagine that seeing these dailies would have been pretty damn exciting. I mean, it was honestly the whole process. It feels like it was just it was just insane. We were in Ireland with these incredible new people we had. I made so many friends and our our team. I cannot believe the the, the talent pool that we were dealing with. Just unbelievable people. Um, and in this gorgeous space and making this movie, you know, was, <laughs> what, what's happening? <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it felt great. And it was, you know, it was not, it was not a huge production. It was still, which meant that we were, because you were asking about working with the DP and the production designer, we were all in one little, you know, one little studio at Ardmore Studios. Um, so we're so close that it's just like you, you know, you can pop in to see Andrew or pop in to see Jade. So it's it was kind of coming out coming up very organic because of that potentially that we're not separate. Right. Now, when you watch dailies, has there ever been a time when you've seen something that you didn't think was entirely working on camera? Definitely. Yep. What happens in that? Can you change things? I mean, if it's already been shot. Yeah. So it depends on the scope of the the costume at that point. Is it like? Is this going to be just the one moment that you know the audience will not notice if you shift it from there, or or is it you know is it it is what it is, which does happen every now and then. Um, but you know if if it's worth, of course you could then also reshoot something if it's you know truly tragic, which luckily <laughs> I've not yet had to do. Um, but I'm sure it does happen eventually. I mean occasionally. Um, but yeah, it just like you have to weigh, you know, what is what is worth pushing. Um, do you adjust it ever so slightly? Is it? Um, I did add actually on Hell or High Water. There was one outfit that I saw the dailies, and it was just a very short snippet of it. And I did add with a felt tip pen. I painted stripes on Chris Pine's shirt. They're very faint. You wouldn't notice, but they're there and they were, it just works better. <laughs> <laughs> when you see the, when you see the work, all the collective work together, uh, when you see the finished film, what are your feelings? Like when you actually sit down and watch something like this and it was such a unique experience, uh, the movie was such a unique experience to see. How do you feel about it when you're, when it, when it all is said and done? Do you ever feel, do you have like post movie, postpartum depression? <laughs> Hugely, yes. So um, in with this movie, we saw a cut of it during the, the film and I actually love it. I, um, I think including your whole team, not only the department heads, but showing the, the wider team what you're working on is so important and it makes everyone so much more invested and work harder and work with more heart because they see the the result of their of their toils um and david david does do that there's you know there's like a little a little screening for everyone so you can see where you're at um and actually i i'm gonna go back on one thing i said about the chris pine shirt it wasn't in the dailies because we did we have dailies i don't think we had dailies we didn't have a video village and we would get assembly every weekend that the whole team, everyone from, you know, the truck drivers to the caterers, everyone would come to the editor's house and we would have a huge party and we would watch the work of the of the week. And it I've never had such a like, crew that was so excited, including, you know, like the truck drivers, like talking about um, the performance and just like in <laughs> love. It was so good. Um. <laughs> I, I, I'm a I as an editor myself, I'm a huge believer in that. You know, yeah. I think it, it, a lot of people now with the secrecy surrounding like comic book movies or things, I don't know if how much you can do that anymore. But I think on a movie, that especially lower budget, lower budget indie cinema or things like this, it goes a long way. So people yeah. aren't because they don't know, you know, pe people don't know. I think it's strange for people that are outside of the industry. There's a lot of times when you work on these movies and you really have no idea how they turned out until you go to yeah. the theater and see it. 
Yeah. And I think it's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Getting that kind of and also you, you, you talked about how people get excited and inspiration. But like you said, you saw something in the assembly where Chris Pine's shirt, you were able to make subtle changes as you moved along that made the movie better. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you have to feel I don't know why else you would be in that industry if you, you're, you're not feeling like part of the, a team, you know, part of the like it. Not everyone has to be creative. Everyone has to be create like giving their their part of the, um, you know, whatever your part is, you, you play it. And I think you play it so much better and so much it's so much more meaningful if you get to see what you're working on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's really it's necessary. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody, if you don't, you're kind of flying blind. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. But the postpartum thing is, that is real. <laughs> that is definitely <laughs> real. And it's more so just after the movie ends, after the shoot ends, than after seeing the the finished film. Um, so I think after seeing the finished film, it's like, oh, the baby went to college. You know? <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> so he did good. It's like, who am I? What am I? What? Why am I here? What am I doing? Um, and it was really interesting. The first year of the pandemic, um, I, my husband is a cinematographer, and and we have, you know, we have a house upstate, and we we're just there for almost a year, just you know, <laughs> doing our little projects. And it was really interesting to feel. To, to ask myself, who am I if I am not designing? Like, what am, what am I for? <laughs> right. <laughs> Society. <laughs> you talk on YouTube. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started making, um, I started make. I realized how much I miss hugging people. So I started um, dyeing fabric in we like various skin tone colors. And I started making these giant hug pillows that have like <laughs> multiple hands and you can like wrap yourself in them. And I was like, this is kind of a weird mix between a household item, a sculpture and a costume. Um, so it was still there somehow, you know, like it, like the textile did help me. Um, and you could open an Etsy store and sell those worldwide. You'd probably make a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, pandemic hug pillows or whatever. That, I think people would still right now would love to have something like that. What a cool thing. I'm telling you, people are going to hear this podcast and they're going to call you. Wait, we want we want your ideas. Let's we'll, we'll market those. It'll be great. Um, so let me ask you this. After you've worked on a lot of diverse kinds of projects, mm -hmm. modern period sci-fi fantasy do you have something that you have yet to tackle a dream project that you would love to uh, to take on um i want to work with i have a list of directors that i really want to work mm. with um i want to work with you know some of the directors i've already worked with i want to work more with them and see where we can go um to me it's honestly it's because again i'm so word based i'm so like script based that the the good story is the the most exciting thing. So it, it doesn't really matter that much where it's um, where it's based, as long as you know it has like an honest, like exciting thing, exciting take on on um, on reality. Sure. Um, I was I was thinking about movies that I that I love and the, the younger directors that that are coming up with you know with new ideas. Um, and I'm super curious about Ali Abbasi, who did the movie called Border, mm. which honestly, I think is the ugliest movie I've ever seen <laughs> um, in a good way. It is so repulsive looking and yet it is gorgeous. So that <laughs> like, I, I can't wait to I hope. Hello, Ali Abbasi, if you're listening. I <laughs> <laughs> um, and also Mati Diop, whose Atlantics is exactly that thing that I, I love, that it has a reality and suddenly it skews and, mm -hmm. and does, something, does something else. Um, yeah, there's just like, I think there's a lot of really, really interesting filmmakers that I, you know, I cannot wait to watch what they do, but also hoping maybe some someday I'll be a part of it too. Well, let me ask you this. We always ask, um, people are going to hear this young people mm -hmm. you know we li now live in a world where first of all do you have a social media account do you i do i have instagram i'm not great at it <laughs> but i do have a, uh, um, an instagram account where can people find you is it your name i think it's malgosha underscore turzanska okay oh, um 
I butchered my own name there. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, uh, what advice can you give to people? I mean, obviously, I, I keep hearing the same thing, which is learn the fundamentals, you know, mm-hmm. learn. But but what what's some advice that you would you would give to people today that want to come up and get into design and costume design? So I, you know, I came up through school and I never really assisted. And this is the thing that I mentioned to you before that I have to reinvent the wheel every time I start a larger project. And I'm very happy where I am, but, and it is a perfectly good way of going going about things, but I wish I PA'd on a few things, you know? I, I wish I just like saw how, how do you make a TV show? How do you make a movie? How, how does the department work? And what are the different positions? Because truth is, maybe you want to be an ager and dyer or maybe you want to be a fitter and you just don't know those positions until you're within the industry at least i had no idea they they existed so maybe you think you want to direct or or be a costume designer but maybe you have a knack for something else like i truly i love aging and dying it's i i love color and i love dirt and it's (laughs) if things go that's got to be the quote of this podcast i love color and i love dirt (laughs) that's fantastic (laughs) Um, but so I didn't know that I could have, you know, uh, gone and, and aged stuff for someone else. Like it didn't, it didn't ever cross my mind. Um, so, so I would say, try, try it out. Just see like if you can, you know, if you can PA or if you can, um, assist someone on, even on, you know, student films, um, just see where you, where you can fit or how you can, where your strengths are and where where your weaknesses are that you then have to work on. But I would say definitely what has helped me hugely is the ability to sketch. And I don't, I I know this is not what everyone does um, and it's not a necessity at all, but it has helped me hugely. It like differentiated me from from Mm -hmm. other people on, on, I don't know, like my my group, so to speak. Um, So if you, if you sketch, keep sketching um, and then learn fabrics, go to museums and watch movies. (laughs) And like reach out to people like Sandy Powell. (laughs) (laughs) To Derek Jarman. (laughs) Uh, That is incredibly, incredibly helpful. Um, You know, it's it's funny, like you say, I, my first job, I worked on Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre three, and I was the art department PA. Amazing. And to this day, it was the hardest job I ever had. I mean, we were working 16 hour days, six days a week. But like you said, uh, what fascinated me was watching like the scenic painters who could take a flat wall made of wood and make it look like it had been there for 80 years through aging and just through paint and color. And I mean, I grew up building models and learning how to weather model airplanes but to watch somebody take a freshly built structure and through yeah. paint and color turn it into something that looked like it was sun beaten and had been there for 80 years blew me away yeah you know and incredible it was incredible and and then i work with the prop guys and seeing what they were able to do and there i've often said to people being a production assistant on a on a film or a television show is one of the most valuable things you can do and i think yeah. a lot of people today don't do i don't hear as much about people doing that. But to me, I'm like, no, I'll do this for like three or four years. I want to know <laughs> what everybody does. It is. I mean, honestly, now, obviously, you can't really intern. That that kind of went away. And I, I wish there was a way for, for younger people to just pop into sets to see, you know, to see what it feels like even. Because truth is, it's not for everyone. It is, despite what we try to do, it is still crazy. It's not a... <laughs> It's it's an exhausting but very thrilling uh, environment, um, but it just it's good to figure out where 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 you fit in or where you want to fit in. Sure. Um, we had an incredible PA on. You were never really here. Actually, she came into the interview and. You were never really here. the The short story was not available in print anywhere. It was off the off the shelves. It was just gone. We had it just photocopied in you know in the department. She came in. She found, she found a Spanish version of it. She doesn't speak Spanish, so she Google translated it because she wanted to know what the story was. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and then she was. Um, 
she grew with us um, for a while. I took her on, on other projects. And then she was Joaquin's uh, personal on Joker. You know, it's like, go, Christy. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the kind of, I mean, that's the kind of, one of the things working on films and you have to anticipate what people need. You have to be there. You can't just wait to be told what to do. And I think that the people that are do those things are obviously, uh, <laughs> those go-getters are what you need um, yeah. and to distinguish yourself. So that's a great story i think people out there listening take that story to heart <laughs> gear, gear man for the win now a fantastic personal costumer <laughs> amazing well listen what do you have i mean i've been i've been waxing rhapsodic about the upcoming x which is looks like it's a balls to the wall horror exploitation film which that trailer knocked me very out good. this might be a closer description of it than, than what than you think <laughs> <laughs> oh oh hence the x in the title um and you've got a new tv series that you're working on here are there are there other uh, things you're prepping or anything that's coming up that you can mention no this for now expats is um we're, we're still in the middle of it we um we started shooting in hong kong I think I started working there in May. Um, I had, again, an inc just an incredible experience. I, I've never been to Hong Kong before and meeting the people and getting to know the culture was ex just excellent. Um, and so we started the project there. We shot some stuff there. Now we're here. Um, so we're, we're still in the middle of it. Mm. For now, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reading some stuff. I'm excited about some stuff, but nothing, nothing official. <laughs> but that's good. Well, listen, you have been an absolute delight. And uh, I want to thank you for, for coming on the Designing Hollywood podcast. And uh, I hope to, well, I will eagerly await what your next project is. And um, hopefully we can uh, speak again. Thank you so, so much. And so Malgosia Trzanska. <laughs> Thank you so much for appearing on the Designing Hollywood podcast. Thank you. And thanks to our sponsor, the United American Costume Company. Since 1977, the American Costume Company has provided wardrobe for hundreds of motion picture and television projects. Their authentic collection is known worldwide to members of the industry and is easily distinguishable on screen. The United American Costume Company can dress your entire cast with an eye for detail and authenticity. A special thanks to our producer and founder, Martika Ibarra, and of course, our co-founder, legendary costume designer, Marilyn Vance. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification button. And you can find the Designing Hollywood podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Also on iTunes. Follow me, Robert Meyer Burnett, on Instagram, on Twitter at BurnettRM, or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. Thanks for watching. We very much appreciate it.